Welcome to Health Watch, presented by Novant Health. I'm your host, June Baker. Our show features local physicians and health professionals discussing health topics of importance to local residents. On today's show, we will feature two past interviews that received great feedback from viewers. First, we will share our interview with orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Thomas Kelso, discussing Brunswick Novant Medical Center's newest orthopedic operating table. Then, we'll feature Dr. Jeffrey Corey of Coastal Carolina Ear, Nose, and Throat, discussing balloon sinuplasty, a relatively new procedure now offered at Brunswick Novant Medical Center. Stay tuned for the next half hour as we bring you Health Watch. Let's first take a look back at our interview with Dr. Thomas Kelso. Welcome, Dr. Kelso. It's good to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Jean. It's nice to be here. Good. Uh, before we get started, would you mind telling our viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. I've been in practice for almost 15 years now and relocated to this area almost exactly a year ago. In fact, it was uh, a year ago to this week that I started practicing here. So we're so. celebrating your anniversary. My one-year anniversary in Brunswick awesome. County. Awesome. So that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, t tell me a little bit about your practice here at Orthopedic Specialists. Yes. Uh, I'm, for my, I, I do, we do all kinds of orthopedic surgeries uh -huh. and uh, take care of all kinds of orthopedic problems at, uh, with our practice. We do a lot of work with people that have shoulder problems, hip mm -hmm. problems, and knee problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I uh, do a lot of uh, arthroscopic surgery mm -hmm. as well as joint replacement operations. And we really try to focus my interests in shoulders, hips, and knees. Shoulders, hips, and knees. Probably have a lot of business here in this area where there's a lot of golfing and tennis and things like that. Yes, especially with, uh, you know, with a population that's sort of in retirement age and they're, they're very active and they want to continue well, stay to stay active. Yes, I want to continue what they like to do, and uh, it's sort of my job to make sure that they can continue being as active as they want to be for as long as they want to be. Good, well, and we're glad that you're here. Well, along with opening a new facility, I'm aware that Brunswick Novant Medical Center has also upgraded its orthopedic equipment, and I understand that they've had added something called the HANA table. Dr. Kelso, what exactly is a HANA table? Well, a HANA table is a very interesting device that helps us with a certain type of hip replacement operation. It has, the table itself is a type of surgical table uh -huh. that allows us to position uh, an individual's body in such a way that improves our, our ability to get exposure to a joint during an operation. It helps us if we were taking care of, say, a person that needed a hip replacement, uh -huh. we would have them, after they go to sleep, they're, they're usually not, a, not awake when we put them on the table. Right. Uh, but we, 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 after they go to sleep, we transfer them from the hospital bed onto the table. Their feet are actually put in custom foam padded boots. Mm -hmm. And then these boots hook into uh, the table so that we can then independently manipulate their, their legs and put them in the proper position so that we can then perform surgery in the optimal manner. And, uh, particularly in, when it comes to hip replacement surgery, it's a very helpful device. I see. And, and what about benefits to the patient? Um, I, it, it sounds like it would be great um, positioning for you, but do the patients actually receive a benefit from that table also? Well, the primary benefit is that they're then able, we're able to do an anterior approach to the hip. Mm -hmm. Now, hip replacement surgeries have, have traditionally used three different uh, surgical approaches to put in the the new p components mm -hmm. either th a direct anterior approach which is sort of an, an uh, 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 it's a way that's gotten increased uh, use in the last five years or so uh, but it's been around for many years but it's sort of been a, a lot of new interest in, in using an anterior appro approach has occurred in the last five years mm -hmm. but other people other surgeons prefer to use either a lateral approach so that we would come make the incision on the side of the hip Okay. or a posterior approach. The benefit of using the anterior approach is the patient's laying flat mm -hmm. so we can get to their, 
that helps in their anesthesia delivery. So oh, I see. That's one of the things. Number two, by going through an anterior approach, you don't have to detach any muscles mm. and minimal muscle tissue um, damage occurs during the surgery. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we were able to make uh, an incision through the skin, place some retractors in appropriate positions, and gain access to the hip joint directly without taking down tendons or damaging muscles. And it's been scientifically shown to create less muscle damage as a result. The benefit here is that it, it has less post-operative pain. Mm -hmm. The real good uh, major benefit of it has been shown to have increased stability. So the risk of oh. a dislocation after the surgery of the, of the ball and the socket components mm -hmm. is greatly reduced. Some, some estimate as much as 20 times lower. And then finally, because of the position of the patient laying flat on their back, we're able, to, and also because of the design of the table, we're able mm -hmm. to bring in a C-arm, which is an x-ray imaging device mm -hmm. that allows us to get images of the position of the components as we're inserting them into their final position. So this allows us to accurately make sure both of the patient's legs or lengths are properly restored, and then also to make sure that the angle and position of the cup and the ball and the stem are just the way we like it. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically we can put in almost perfect alignment of the components by using the HANA table and the C-arm. Welcome, Dr. Corey. It's a pleasure to have you back on the show again. Thank you. Now, for those viewers who didn't, haven't met you yet, would you share some information about your education and your background with them? Sure. Uh, I originally grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I did my undergraduate work at the University of Scranton and then moved to Philadelphia for nine years where I did medical school at Philadelphia College of Medicine and then five years at Hahnemann University and then moved down to Whiteville, North Carolina four years ago. Great. Um, well, what exactly does an eye, ear, nose, and throat physician do? It used to be eye, ear, nose, and throat, and then about 10, 15 years ago, the eyes actually got pretty subspecialized, so then we actually separated, but it is one of the oldest specialties, so now mm -hmm. we're ear, nose, and throat, and um, we, our technical name is otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, facial plastic surgery, so we wow. do quite a bit. That's a big mouthful. And uh, it is, and we do general surgery for three years, <clears throat> and then we specialize in three years for ear, nose, and throat. Mm -hmm. And we do a wide array of uh, problems, and we deal with kids, so we do tonsils, mm -hmm. we take out the adenoids, we place tubes, we deal with kids who have hearing problems, neck masses, kids who have allergies, we deal with them as well and do sinus mm -hmm. surgery and treat them for sinusitis. Regarding the ear with adults, we deal with chronic, sin chronic ear infections, people who need hearing aids and hearing tests. Uh, nose, obviously we deal with allergy and sinus issues. Throat, we deal with sleep apnea. Patients who are surgical candidates for sleep apnea, we do operate on the nose to straighten out the septum and operate on the throat to take out the tonsils and uh, tissue in the back of the throat to help them breathe better. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It is. Was there something that inspired you to choose this specialty? Uh, the specialty itself is very intriguing. The anatomy of the head and neck and uh -huh. the ears, nose and throat is uh, very intriguing and it's a nice mix of office hours and mm -hmm. surgery and we get to see a wide variety of ages from young to old. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about your practice here in Brunswick County. Sure. Uh, I moved to Whiteville, North Carolina four years ago and I joined Coastal Carolina Ear, Nose and Throat mm -hmm. and I began to work with Dr. Demuzio and Dr. Kenyon. We opened up a small satellite office down, in C, down at uh, Seaside and we stayed there for approximately two to three years and business started to boom so then we decided to move closer to the hospital when I got on staff at Brunswick mm -hmm. and now we have an office in Shalot. Mm. Well today I want to talk to you about uh, sinusitis and that new procedure that I understand you're doing at Brunswick Community Hospital. But first, tell us what sinusitis is. Sure, uh, I think it's a good idea to explain why we have sinuses and what the mm -hmm. sinuses are first. So, the sinuses are holes in the skull and they're lined with a lining much similar to the lining in our mouth. And that lining has hair cells and the hair cells basically transport mucus and bacteria that, that get trapped in the nose out of the sinuses through little holes called ostea or exit holes. Mm -hmm. Once in the nose, the bacteria gets sweeped down to the stomach where we digest it. So that's one purpose of the sinuses. The second purpose is so that it lightens our skull so we're not walking around with a 40-pound head. 
and also it affects resonation so we can mm -hmm. speak louder, more effective resonation. Mm -hmm. And sinusitis is any type of inflammation that inflames the lining of the sinuses that causes pain and pressure, and that lining that surrounds that hole or ostia gets closed shut, and that causes the symptoms of sinusitis. And the symptoms are again? Pain and pressure over the sinus region, such mm -hmm. as the maxillary sinus, the cheek area, mm -hmm. near the nose, that's the ethmoid sinuses, the frontal sinus on top of the skull. It causes pain, congestion, post-nasal drip, and in the acute phase, pus, nasal congestion, and occasionally a fever. Once the acute phase is over, some patients experience chronic sinusitis, which is mm -hmm. a lingering symptom like post-nasal drip or a cough or continued facial pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that sinusitis is one of the most common chronic health problems in the United States. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. Um, what are some of the causes of sinus trouble? Well, anything that affects the lining and inflames the lining can cause sinusitis. So pollutants, oh. allergies, viral infections, and especially bacterial infections. Some people al also have altered anatomy where if they've gotten hit in the nose where they're younger and have a deviated septum, which is the midline of the nose, that can crunch the sinuses together and make those, ho those holes naturally smaller. So that sets them up for a sinus infection just in case a virus or a bacteria enters where if it swells slightly enough that it would close off the hole in those patients who have anatomical problems. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned um, allergies and I know I have a lot of allergies. What part does that play in the sinusitis? Well, an allergy is a response to something that's normal in the environment. So uh -huh. trees are normal, grass is normal, yeah. dogs and cats. But in patients who have allergies, they're hypersensitive to these chemicals. Mm -hmm. So for instance, pollen. If a patient is allergic to pollen, the pollen enters the nose and enters the sinus. Mm -hmm. And basically the body goes haywire over and tries to wall it off. So the lining gets inflamed, the mucus gets thick, and it tries to trap it. Unfortunately, when it traps it, the lining gets tight again, that hole gets tight, you get pain and pressure, bacterial infection can ensue, and then you have sinusitis. Mm. Okay. What are some of the preliminary um, treatments for sinusitis? Well, it's normal for people to get sinus infections one to two times a year. And uh -huh. initially, if a patient is in the winter time and they're around sick people and they get a sinus infection, mm -hmm. they go to their primary care doctor and he evaluates them. If they have a viral infection, sometimes we'll give them nasal rinses and nasal steroids to get them over that period. If he thinks it's bacteria or allergy, he'll treat them accordingly. Sometimes he'll give antibiotics, and usually a short course will take care of it, about 10 days. Nasal rinses and nasal steroids help, as well as neti pots and mm -hmm. saline. So most people do get better with that treatment. Mm -hmm. Some people need to come back to the doctor if they continue with their sinus infections, and then they receive maybe another course of antibiotics mm -hmm. or a longer course and if it continues then the primary care doctor thinks there's something out of their realm and decides to send them to me mm -hmm. so that I can take a good look at them and when I see them in the office I see what antibiotics they were on what nasal rinses they were on and see what the cause is if the cause is allergic I'll treat their allergies mm -hmm. if the cause is bacterial we'll treat them with the right appropriate antibiotic mm -hmm. I'll do nasal endoscopy in the office to rule out polyps or any type of septal or deviated septum that they have and see if their sinus ostia are actually open. Mm -hmm. If I think they need a CAT scan, I'll get them a CAT scan so we can take a look deeply into their sinuses and see if actually the infection has cleared out or if that lining is still continued to be thick, that maybe those patients can be surgical.